You may remember this scene from It's a Wonderful Life. George Bailey, played by James Stewart, misplaced a large deposit, a huge mistake that would not only put him in legal trouble, but would surely end the business his father started. With no will to survive, he stumbles out in traffic and decides to take a final swim. In George's mind, his life insurance policy is worth more to his family than he is alive. But before he jumps, the man falls into the icy water. George jumps in to rescue him. The man, who claims to be an angel, talks George down from any future bridge jumping activities. And the scene ends with this statement. I suppose it'd been better if I'd never been born at all. What'd you say? I said I wish I'd never been born. As the film unfolds, we are taught a lesson about the inherent value of life, even amidst suffering and hardship. But is it really true that life is wonderful for everyone? What if I told you that there is a group of people that think George had it right? That he would have been better off if he hadn't existed? And even worse, if you gave them the option to snap their fingers and eliminate all of humanity? They would do it. Okay. That was a bit dramatic, but in all seriousness, I found a group of people who prefer all of humanity to not exist. They call themselves antinatalists, and they're part of a growing philosophy who ultimately want everyone to stop having kids. We're gonna meet some of them and try to understand how anyone could arrive at this alarming conclusion. And I also want to talk to their critics who are called pronatalists, people who encourage others to have children. Regardless of whether you agree with antinatalist logic, there is valuable insight to be gained. So take a deep breath. This is an alarming topic with huge implications for most people. When we think of a human life, some picture a pregnant mother glowing with anticipation, young children with bright futures, or perhaps a high school graduation or a young couple in love. Most of us can see the joy in humanity. And while life does have happiness, every life has certain pain and suffering. Some children are born with terminal conditions, like this young girl who will never make it out of childhood. As a parent, the most important thing to do is to protect your child, and we're told that she has this terminal illness with no cure or treatment. Or maybe your child will be born with a condition that's not even identified yet that would take this young teen's life only six months after this story was published. He has a disease so rare, doctors don't even have a name for it. We don't know what the future holds. And that's, that's scary to think about because I have lots of plans, lots of ambition, lots of things that I want to do in life. Uh, never in a million years would it have occurred to me that as a preacher, uh, I might be called to deliver my son's eulogy until it hit me a couple years ago uh, that I might have to as his illness progressed. Now, of course, I don't have to. I know other preachers. <laughs> <laughs> but when I became a father, I promised myself that my children would get my absolute best. And along with pushing my son's wheelchair all over Kingdom Come and getting him dressed in the morning, what else does my best include except delivering his eulogy? That doesn't mean I know how the hell to do this. <laughs> how do you deliver your son's eulogy? I'm not here to pretend that we're all happy now because Mitchell is in heaven. In faith, I believe he is with God, but the painful, mysterious, drawn out, slowly incapacitating death of an incredible young man with such profound gifts in the prime of his life, that is among the most senseless tragedies any novelist could invent. We are not happy. Also, I'm not here to solve the mystery of this situation. I have never known so many people to be praying so diligently in unison for someone to get better. Mitchell didn't get better. As we prayed, he got worse. It felt like a cruel joke. Now, I understand people get sick and die. I understand that. 
But the big problem here is that Jesus assures us that we will receive whatever we ask for in faith, which we did. I don't get it. I don't mean to be rude, but you don't get it. We will continue thinking about the unfairness and the mystery of this for the rest of our lives, but we are not here this afternoon to solve it. No one's getting out of this game of life alive, and there's a growing community with a definitive solution to this problem. And they argue, it's better never to have been. Lucky for me, I have three healthy children. No genetic or debilitating chronic diseases for us so far. We were fortunate to have had twins, and 10 years after their birth, we decided to try again. And try again we did. This is our youngest daughter. But unlike most parents, our initial glimpse of our baby wasn't captured by an ultrasound machine. In what would have been considered science fiction a century ago, this snapshot was our first introduction to her. She was in a petri dish, incubating before the last step of the in vitro fertilization process, the embryo transfer. Unlike nearly half of all pregnancies worldwide, which are unintended, IVF pregnancies are just about the most intentional way of having a child. After tens of thousands of dollars, months of hormone treatments, genetic testing, and a minor surgery, my wife was finally done. Oh yay, I'm done. Because luck would strike again. The embryo would implant and we would have a successful birth on the first try, which is not common. Many things can and do go wrong all the time, but that's the game of life. We don't know what's in store for us. I could have died in my previous career working as a firefighter, and any one of us could die tomorrow on the way to the grocery store. The truth is, no matter how much we stack the deck in our favor, we don't control our destiny or the destiny of our offspring. And how long will my family continue this streak of serendipity? And was it wrong to bring new life into this world, knowing full well that bad things do happen to good people? And what about the lives of my children? I gave them life, but I also imposed a death sentence on them. They'll be considered lucky if I am not here when they eventually die. And no matter how you look at it, I gambled with their life without their consent. And sure, we screened them for genetic anomalies, but any number of things can happen to them or their environment that are completely out of their control. Can I be sure that they will be better off than to have never been? Did I make a mistake? I sure hope not. And to explore these questions in more detail, I met up with the founder of Stop Having Kids, and we chose Texas, the Lone Star State known for its traditional family values. And other values, like the right to free speech. If you could just stay off to the side, sure. you're more than welcome. You know, I appreciate you guys exercising your First Amendment right, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, thanks guys. And what better time to chat with people about not having children than Mother's Day weekend? Cool. Keep doing that. At first, it would seem that the value of free speech would be well respected here in Texas. That's offensive. The joy I have is my grandchildren are amazing. And yes, they have a It's through the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and our church and their upbringing of learning right from wrong. That's where it's at. You create a soul. If you, you create a soul, offensive. what about the children that end up in we hell? We need because children, we need population. Because What's wrong with you? <laughs> that one was fired up. Yeah. I just wanted to see what she was saying. So. Oh, she yeah. said she was offended. Yeah, I figured. Because um, she said that children and grandchildren bring her joy. We're, we're not saying anything bad about children. We're just saying to not create new humans. Not because of, not because of children. It's... Uh, because of what humans can experience and what humans can cause for others. And why don't we prioritize life that's already here and in the need over the unborn? There's so much life yeah, here. everyone's got free speech, so. Yeah, thank you. But what happens when one value threatens another in this state that prides itself on protecting fundamental rights? We're not going to go into measurements. I'm just telling you right now, this is all heritage property. You're not allowed to be at the store. And then if you stand here and do that, now you're impeding the sidewalk. We've been here for, I don't know, maybe just 10 or 15 minutes, but everyone's have. been walking through just fine. You so you've seen it. that, right? Yes, yeah. You can stand in stationary, you're considered impeding. 
because if somebody wants to walk there, they can't. They'd have to walk around you. But no one was having difficulty walking around. Did you that's see why us? I'm here. I just got a phone call. Uh huh. From the shop owner, probably right. From their customers coming in the store. Yes. You you are so just because they don't want us here, but not because we're actually blocking foot traffic, though. So I okay. you to keep moving. Well, where would you suggest we stand? Not here. You're not going to be able to do it. The stock hurts. Yeah, so we can be on the public sidewalk, right? As long as you're not impeding the sidewalk. So we can stand over there? You cannot be stationary. you got to keep moving. So we can just walk back, back and forth. If you want to keep walking, you can do that. So <laughs> we can't even stand against the uh, the rails over there? Not if you're stationary. So, uh, I, I, can, I can pace. And these guys weren't going to be bullied by this neighborhood police officer. So they paced around with their signs. Yeah, I already did an hour on the treadmill today, but... I'll do more. Which, if anything, was more effective than what they were doing before. And how on earth could their signs be considered disturbing the peace? Most people in this neck of the woods would likely classify themselves as pro-life. I am part of pro-life. For example, the Texas Heartbeat Act was passed a few years ago. It bans most abortions at about the six-week mark, when fetal heartbeats can be detected, often long before most women know they are pregnant, and certainly long before a woman realizes she's had an unintended pregnancy. Millions of children lose their right to life every year. Every unborn child who has a heartbeat will be saved from the ravages of abortion. And I'm not going to get into an abortion debate in this video, but the antinatalist sees the debate around abortion as missing the forest for the trees. In their eyes, all pregnancies are bad, not just the unintended ones. Anyway, back to Fort Worth. This is Dietz, the founder of Stop Having Kids, and we were also joined by Noodles, a fellow antinatalist activist who, for whatever reason, attracts the religious crowd. He's got to average like five or six hands-on prayers per day. And you could say I was curious how this crowd would receive antinatalism. And while we did have people knocking over signs, you're the one that was spreading hate. And people were yelling some pretty nasty stuff. Your mom got a hat too? She should have boarded too? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she should have boarded yeah. too. She don't deserve to breathe. That's what she don't deserve to breathe. I'll pray for you. We'll pray for you. <laughs> Same, bro. I'm trying to leave some unborns on somebody's back. And a lot of people asked to take photos. Take a picture. It was hard to figure out sometimes if people understood what Deets and Noodles were advocating. Honey, take a picture of me. Like this mother, who doesn't quite get it. Good for y'all. As a mother who uh, agrees with this message, what part of it really stood out to you? Like, when did you decide that this is something you really believe in? Because if you can't take care of your kids on your own, you shouldn't be having them. Mm -hmm. And people aren't taking care of their kids and they're not doing what they're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. They do it without knowing how serious it is. How serious it is, yeah. They undervalue the suffering that can happen. 100%. Right. And we ran into plenty of people who think antinatalism is just another word for incel or a life of voluntary exactly. celibacy. Howdy. Why does it take your shoes out? My, sh my shoes. Yeah, you don't need that sign with those shoes on. Why? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Can you explain that to me? He was criticizing you because of your shoes? Yeah, he said I don't need this sign with these shoes on. That's what happens when you wear Converse in the South. And it was really common for there to be a person who found the idea fascinating, but the group they came with would drag them away. They're bleeding. Okay. Yeah, I don't... Crack. Okay, no nice problem. Good talking to you. Dad, don't get involved. Don't get involved. Don't video him. <laughs> you guys should listen. He brings up good points. Would you like a condom? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's an XL, by the way. A good number of people express how they just don't like children, which is sort of missing the mark. I hate kids. They're nasty. They're sticky. Like kids specifically or humans? Deets and Noodles don't hate children. In fact, they despise bad parents. It's sort of awkward watching someone realize what they're about. This isn't actually uh, specifically against children. It's about not creating new lives. We believe we should be prioritizing life that's already here and in need over creating new ones. Um, it's and some people would just be completely rude, like a scene out of Mean Girls. Okay. I just wanted to make fun of y'all real hard later on. <laughs> oh, yeah? I needed evidence. I'd love to hear your arguments yeah, against this. Like this lady who asked to take a photo and then told Noodles she was going to use the photo to make fun of him later. And I think the most frustrating part for me is I think most people just didn't get what Deets and Noodles were saying. 
this is a compassionate movement. No, we're, no, we're, no, yeah. It's not a compassionate no, movement. It's yeah. a selfish movement. The world okay, needs more people. Tell me something. It's what is kids. one unselfish reason to procreate? Unselfish reason to think about that. Unselfish yeah. reason to procreate. Because unselfish. it betters the entire world How? to bring somebody here. But is that something kids. you care about? If we stop yes. yes. And you, so yes. that's something you want, right? Yes. Yes. So therefore it is selfish, right? You're saying it's okay to use a human as a means to an end, as a utility. Can you name a reason to procreate that is both unselfish and ethical? What? Okay. I'm gonna give my life to that child. I'm going to do everything I can to raise that child. You're only doing that because they exist, right? What? It's my dream when right. I was a little girl to become right. a mom one day. Oh, so there, that's my point. That is a selfish so, okay. th that endeavor. And I was very unimpressed with most people's answer to the question, what is one unselfish and ethical reason to have children? The most common response by far was we need more people and we can just strike that one down immediately. Any response that starts with I or me or humanity is selfish by definition. It's also selfish to bring children into the world to fund future pensions, retirement plans, or the economy, or to deal with our national debt, not theirs. It's also inherently selfish to bring a child into the world to fulfill your dreams of becoming a parent. And it's also selfish to bring a child into the world to help us become a multi-planetary species, first inhabiting Mars. The biggest problem the world will face in 20 years is population collapse. I want to emphasize this. The biggest issue in 20 years will be population collapse. Elon may be right that we are going to face some serious problems in the near future. And according to Musk, humanity won't make it off the planet if we don't do something about this impending population crisis. So he's fathered 12 children with three different women. And while you might say that parenting requires a lot of money, time and energy, which can be viewed as selfless. The antinatalist perspective challenges the very choice to bring new life into the world. From this viewpoint, the act of having children isn't seen as selfless, but rather as imposing existence on someone without their consent. And in Elon's family, they're born with a tremendous to-do list. Save humanity. Don't get me wrong, these people seem to be great parents. But antinatalism is the critique of the act of procreation, the imposition of life, the lack of consent, and the burdens we place and that exist naturally on all new life. Before I headed out from Fort Worth, I had packed up all my gear and I was having a good chat with Deets and Noodles before I left, which is nearly impossible because their signs attract so much attention. And they started a conversation with this guy. And I butted in and asked him the question. I have been disappointed with people's response to this one question they've been asking me, which is, okay, yeah. do you think of an ethical, unselfish reason to have a child? Give others a chance to do something they're decent. The audio is bad, I know. I had put my mics away, but if you didn't catch what his answer was, it was to give someone a chance to do something amazing. And he later clarifies that essentially, experiencing life is amazing. Even one good moment out of this life is something to live for. Not if you end up in hell because of it. Okay, well, I mean, okay. <laughs> like, in fact, hey, I'll do, I'll do one better. Take Christianity out. Like, even if we go in the ground, if you have one good day, it, it, like, compared to nothing, yeah. that's better to live for that. Maybe this Texan bodybuilder was onto something. He was the first person who gave a selfless reason to create a life. But this answer wouldn't satisfy the stop having kids advocates because he didn't answer the ethical question. Should we be creating new life? In the first episode of True Detective, Rusty Cole, played by Matthew McConaughey, is being pressed by his partner, Marty, after he learns that Cole isn't a Christian. Marty asks a philosophical question. But you're not a Christian, so what do you believe? I'd consider myself a realist, all right? But in philosophical terms, I'm what's called a pessimist. I think human consciousness was a tragic misstep in evolution. We became too self-aware. Nature created an aspect of nature separate from itself. We are creatures that should not exist by natural law. Hmm, that sounds god fucking awful, Rust. We are things that labor under the illusion of having a self, this accretion of sensory experience and feeling, programmed with total assurance that we are each somebody. When in fact, everybody's nobody. I wouldn't go around spouting that shit I was you. People around here 
Don't think that way. I don't think that way. I think the honorable thing for our species to do is deny our programming. Stop reproducing. Walk hand in hand into extinction. One last midnight, brothers and sisters opting out of a raw deal. And we're familiar with that look. It's perfectly natural. And I'd say we're biologically programmed to feel this way. But it's not an argument. This is Nick Pizzolatto, the writer behind True Detective. He created Matthew McConaughey's character after reading one of the most influential antinatalist books, Better Never to Have Been by David Benatar, an academic at the University of Cape Town. Benatar is somewhat of a mysterious person. He has never appeared on camera, and there are virtually no photos of him anywhere except for an unverified video I found from 2013 with this grainy photo. In interviews, Benatar has refused to answer the question of whether he has children himself. He later revealed that he doesn't, but the point remains. He wants his work to stand on its own merit. It doesn't matter what he looks like or how he's lived his life. If the argument holds, it's valid. And I can respect that. He's known for the infamous asymmetry argument, where he draws the conclusion that coming into existence is always a harm. Always. And to help us understand Benatar's argument, today we're going to be talking about something called antinatalism. I explained Benatar's arguments to my children, and I must admit this is sort of weird, but if you're one of my kids, you are no stranger to the classroom discussions. So what we're going to learn about today... Attitude. Very good. Good. I cannot even read that. I've been doing this about as long as they can remember. Here's the basic argument, okay? You have a situation A, and you have situation B. In situation A, you exist. Uh -huh. <laughs> In situation B, you do not exist. One minor correction here, it's more correct to say that in situation B, you never exist. I clarify this a bit more later. Okay, back to the video. Okay, so a way to think about this is, you can think of Mia as well. For context, Mia is their younger sister. So Mia exists in situation A and Mia does not exist in situation B. You're somewhat familiar with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because Mia didn't exist a few years ago and she exists today. But you can also think of this as in Mia and Michael. Who's Michael? A, a child that we have not had. Or Michelle. Or Micah. <laughs> or Mary. Just all the M's. We could have more children and name them all those names, but we don't. They, they simply just do not exist. So when we think of a life that you're going to live, do you remember our discussion about happiness? Yeah. yeah. We talked about pleasure and pain. We kind of talked about how pleasure doesn't equal happiness, Yeah. but it's a part of it. Uh -huh. But there's suffering and there's pleasure and they're kind of on opposite sides of the, of the spectrum. So if you exist, you can experience pain. All right, and you can also experience pleasure. Right. Would you rather be in pain or would you rather not be in pain? I would rather not be in pain okay. personally, so but pain, that's just personal choice. for most people is considered a bad thing. And pleasure or happiness is good. Now, if you don't exist, the fact that there's no pain is good. Yeah, but there's no pleasure either. But don't you either. have to experience pain right. to have happiness? Pain is not the same thing as frustration overcoming or a challenge something. or overcoming something difficult. Yeah. Pain is like kind of never good. Like now, down. because we live in a world where there is pain and suffering and to be happy, you need to get through it. And I think you will do better if you don't dwell on pain and think about it all day. But we would never say that pain is good. If you do not exist, there's no pain for that non-existent being for Michelle that we have not had. They will never experience pain, and you can say that that's a good thing. However, for the non-existent being, they cannot experience pleasure. Or anything. This is the tricky one. And this is what Benatar would say, it's not bad, it's not bad. For the non-existent being that does not exist, who isn't here, they can't be deprived of pleasure. They do not experience pain and suffering, which is good. However, they do not experience all the pleasures in life. 
They don't get to eat ice cream. They don't get to have happy days. They don't have birthdays. They don't have all those things. That's depressing. They don't exist, so they can't be depressed. Yeah. Okay, so in another way of thinking of not bad is no worse. That's actually so really no weird to think about. Than being good. Over here, you have one bad thing and one good thing. And over here, you have one good thing and something that's not bad. And so he would say, not existing is preferable to existing. But if you don't exist, you don't have like the opportunity to feel pleasure and like have like a, a life, you know, that like. I'm not like, man, I'm, I'm really looking forward to stubbing my toe today. Like, I'm really excited for that. But it's like, there's so many good things that like overcome that. Like, yeah, hurting sometimes is like way better than like just not experiencing anything ever. Yeah, like getting a scrape, like it's not like a reason not to live. Benatar would say is that harms and pains far outweigh pleasures and happiness. No. So let me give you an example. Definitely not true. Have you ever seen somebody smiling and walking down the street and just super happy and you ask them, why are you so happy? And they say, well, three or five years ago, I had this really pleasurable experience and I'm just still happy from it. Have you ever heard of that? No. No, I've never heard of that. However, it is very common to see somebody walking down the street very sad. And if you were to ask them why they're sad, they could point at something three, five, ten years ago that happened. They lost a child. They lost a husband. They had a terminal cancer diagnosis a year ago. They um, have severe chronic pain that they're dealing with. Let me ask you a question. I, I could grant you, I'm a magic genie, and I can grant you an hour of pure bliss. Some of the best pleasure. Think of like eating the best ice cream ever you've ever had in your life in the most comfortable position with the perfect climate on a, the most comfortable couch you've ever been on. Just pure bliss for an hour. However, in exchange for that, I'm gonna smash your toes for five minutes with a hammer. Just five minutes though. Would you do that trade off? No. No. No, I, oh, I would oh. like to keep my toes, thank you. Well, I mean like, so you wouldn't have any permanent damage, but you have to experience the pain of me smashing your, your toes with a hammer for five minutes. You may think, oh, there's all these good things in life, right? There's a lot of amazing things in life, but you can't deprive a non-existent person of the good things. Okay, let's say, you go to have a child and you look at an embryo and it has this terrible disease and you have an embryo that doesn't, you have a moral duty to pick this one over here, right? Yeah. People would think you're crazy if you pick the one that has the bad disease. So you have a moral duty to avoid harm, but no one says that there's a duty to make more children. No one would say, oh my gosh, you've deprived a non-existent being. So think of like the Michelle, the Michael, the future children that mommy and daddy could have, no one is looking at us and going, why are you not making more children so that they can experience pleasure? Symmetry is when things are the same on both sides. You have two eyes, like your body is pretty symmetrical. You have two eyes. Now, there's obviously people who don't, you know, but in general, we are symmetrical. So what he's saying is that there's an asymmetry. If you exist, you have one good thing and one bad thing. You have pleasure and you have pain. If you don't exist, you have no pain and you're not missing out on anything because you don't exist. What do you think this means if you accept this philosophy? No, have kid. If everyone just stop having kids, then eventually everyone will die and then there'll just be nobody. That's sad for us to think about that. But for someone who doesn't exist, how much does it affect them? Nothing. Zero. So are you sad for all of the Martians that don't exist on Mars? No. No. All the moon people who don't, who don't live on the moon, who don't exist, are we sad for them? No. So in the future, if there were no humans, it's like, I'm not gonna be here. They don't even exist. There's nothing really to be sad about. There's, there's, there's no one to be deprived. When you create somebody, you've now created somebody who can now experience pain and all of those things. Yes, what he would argue, if you have a child, you are necessarily causing harm. You are creating harm every time you create a child. I created you into this world. I'm responsible for your life in a lot of ways. Now, I can't live your life. I can't make you do things, but I'm going to support you your entire life and hope that you, and of course, Mia too, have an amazing life. And yes, you're right. Parenting has a big impact on how the child turns out, but you will experience suffering. There's no way around it. I cannot protect you from everything. I won't even be here. 
if, if things go perfectly in the, most, in the best way, when you die, I won't be there. If I'm there when you die, something went wrong. Then that means you lived a shorter life than I did. Yeah. So, well, I should die before you. So the bottom line is, is that I'm going to do everything I can to set you guys up for success. Mommy and daddy will, but I will not be there when you're in some of your darkest times. Isn't that sad? <laughs> After talking with my children, I didn't go into extreme detail about all the things that can go wrong, such as halopo Siemens syndrome. The disease causes a child's skin to slough off when exposed to air. And if you try to feed the child, their mouths will eventually collapse. And they are always in intense pain. Half of the children die within the first year. In some cases, the child may live to the age of 12 before they inevitably contract skin cancer. But what do Benatar's critics have to say? I think this is one of the most insane claims I have ever heard. He's not the first person to say it. So it just ignores what economists call opportunity cost. The good thing that you could have had but don't is a loss. This is Dr. Brian Kaplan, professor of economics at George Mason University and a New York Times bestselling author. And I sat down with him at UT Austin to talk about his most relevant work related to this topic, selfish reasons to have more kids. What does pronatalism mean to you? Right, I do call myself a pronatalist, or usually to shorten it to natalist, it's cleaner. To me, it just means thinking that when you create new life, you are generally doing a good thing for the world. Not in absolutely every case, Hitler's mom screwed up, but what are the odds that your kid's the next Hitler? Much more likely that your kid is going to be a roughly decent person who enjoys life and contributes to the world. So I call the book Selfish Reasons to Have More Kids because I do present a totally prudential argument from the point of view of the individual potential parent. I also, however, have a chapter about the social effects where I say, look, if you like the idea of having kids but you're refraining out of guilt, don't feel guilty because on balance, you're making the world a better place. In his book, Kaplan argues that having children can be less demanding and more enjoyable than many people believe. And he doesn't want to encourage all childless couples to start cranking out babies. It's just that many parents overestimate the impact of their efforts on their children's outcomes at the expense of their own satisfaction and enjoyment, which could include decisions that restrict their family planning. One of the many examples he uses in the book is club sports. While they could be great for some families, many parents could not afford or do not have enough time to put several children in club sports at the same time. And as it turns out, club sports don't impact your child's outcome all that much at all. Kaplan points to twin adoption research revealing that genetics significantly outweighs most parenting decisions. And he was also quick to dismantle Benatar's asymmetry. If you could have won the lottery, you didn't, that's bad. It's like, well, it's like, well, it's not bad in the sense that you were worse off than if you had lost a million dollars. It's bad to have failed to have won a million dollars and you're, you would not talk any person of common sense out of this conclusion. Kaplan's dispute with Benatar's asymmetry argument is that the absence of pleasure is not, not bad, but bad. And if that's the case, then we no longer have an asymmetry. If the negatives and positives cancel out, the equation is balanced. Asymmetry is nonsense. Failure to get a good thing is actually, in principle, just as bad as the experiencing of a bad thing. And the prudent thing is to net, to sum. Full stop, iron line in the sand, no reasonable person would ever think otherwise, and only a weird dogma would get you off on some other track. I reached out to Malcolm and Simone Collins, who run pronatalist.org and they shared their opinions about the asymmetry argument. I can see why the asymmetry hypothesis is so compelling to people. If you believe, like many pro-lifers do, that life is something that just like all of a sudden exists or doesn't exist, it can be a logical position. However, if you are the type of person who I think is like, like most people uh, approach life, you think life is a spectrum of potentiality. If I do something today that causes suffering to someone who's not yet born, that thing is still a moral negative action. And I think because that's intuitively, a lot of people don't see life as being binary. They see it as 
as being the spectrum of potentiality and by denying potential humans the right to make a choice about their own existence, I am causing harm to those potential humans, even if they don't come to exist through my actions. Malcolm and Simone aren't just armchair intellectuals. The couple is planning on having a lot of children. We're going to have more than seven if we can, basically, until my uterus is forcibly removed in a botched surgery. <laughs> I'm going to keep going. <laughs> Malcolm and Simone believe that genetics play a huge role in the happiness and success of a future child. And so all of their children and future children are genetically screened and planned using IVF. And let's say they do everything right. They select the embryos with the best genetics and a family with good parental happiness and well-being. And they do the other things like provide basic care, safety, education, and socialization. And the goal of parenting is not some selfish mini-me experiment, but to give the child a good life. What's wrong now? Even if it would be a net benefit to someone to exist, it's wrong to go and give someone a package that includes anything bad without their consent. So you can say, look, I can't go and pick a person off the street, grab them, put them in a cage without asking where they want it, and then give them a million bucks at the end and say, you're better off, so I didn't need your consent. You need their consent anyway. And there's the problem that you cannot get consent from someone before they exist. And so that is a, at least a much cleaner argument for why it's wrong to create a life, because you can't ask someone whether they want to exist before they're born. There is a concept in philosophy called hypothetical consent. Normally, you don't need it because you can just ask people's consent. But there is a range of questions where hypothetical consent is highly illuminating and, and to say that, it, that you just reject it is crazy. If you find someone who is passed out by the side of the road and they need CPR, normally they will not have a sign around their neck saying, I consent to CPR. This is one where you say, well, he, I, I can't ask him because he's unconscious about whether he wants to be saved, but I believe he would say it. It is reasonable to think that he would say it. I don't have any other opportunity. If he were awake, I would ask him, but he's not awake. He's not going to be awake. It's a choice of either let him die or assume consent, and so I will do it. That's hypothetical consent. That's a valid use, and it also directly applies to whether it's okay to create a human life. It's impossible to go and get their consent before they're born, so that's where you got to say, well, is it likely to think, is it reasonable to think that they would consent? It's yes, because typical human life, though it always contains some suffering, on balance is a good deal. In the EMS world, we call it implied consent. So here's a man unconscious on the street. And I've treated a lot of unconscious people like this when I was a firefighter and paramedic. This man overdosed on opiates. It could be heroin, hydrocodone, morphine, or even fentanyl. And let's say you had a reversal agent that you could administer, saving his life almost immediately. What would you do? All right, here we go. Bottoms or things over windows. He's saying, why did you pull? You were a little bit of sweat. Don't wait. Touch me, bro. No, because I touched you too. I gave you a sternum rub and you wouldn't wake up. I woke the fuck up. Maybe he's being irrational and doesn't understand the condition he was in. Or perhaps he's suicidal and doesn't value his life at all. Let me die, yo! Let me die! What fuck the life do you understand? It just goes to show you that even in circumstances like this, you can be wrong, even when you are well-meaning. I'm going to hell! You're going to hell! And I'd argue if you want to be left alone, maybe don't overdose on a busy street corner. But in any case, is this man an ungrateful human? Like an antinatalist who has been given the gift of life only to complain after the fact. Malcolm had a slightly different take on the consent issue. For us, morally, the only person who can decide if a life is worth living is the person living that life. Um, and so when somebody says you're bringing children into this world without their consent, that is true, but we are also not not morally against suicide. Like you're even pro like assisted suicide due to what happened to Simone's mom. This is an issue that's actually very important to us. Um, people can choose to end their lives functionally whenever they want. And I think what antinatalists don't like 
is the burden of the consequences of that choice are on their shoulders. And they'll say, I don't want to deal with having to make that choice. And to me, what I'm hearing is I would deny someone else the right to live, someone else who would have enjoyed existing, who would have not wanted to take this choice, just so I don't personally have to deal with the responsibility of this choice. That to me seems like a completely morally monstrous position. And so while this man may not wish to be resuscitated, only a monster would walk away from him with the antidote in hand. 2,500 years ago, Epicurus said, look, if you really actually think life is not worth living, we're in Greece, there's a cliff. The fact that you don't do it shows even you don't believe your own argument. And if you don't believe your own argument, I'm not gonna bother arguing with you. I think that it's totally commendable when you correctly perceive that you are going to have an immense negative amount of pleasure for the rest of your life to kill yourself. And I think if people care about you, they will understand that. I just think that you should wait until that really happens. Uh, there's the movie Little Miss Sunshine where this old guy who's like 80 and using heroin goes and talks to his grandkids and he says, look, don't use drugs. At your age, it's crazy to use drugs. At my age, it's crazy not to. And don't you start taking that shit. When you're young, you're crazy to do that stuff. What about you? What about me? I'm old. When you get old, you're crazy not to do it. Any young person, if you feel depressed or sad and you're listening to this, don't kill yourself. Definitely do not. You know, there are so many ways to turn your life around. You're just, you haven't even scratched the surface. On the other hand, if you're 90 and you are in at constant agony and your prognosis is just to get worse and worse, then totally kill yourself. And that is absolutely my personal plan is when things look really bad to do it and I'll be happy to do it. And like that will like, so I think that's totally reasonable. I'm not someone who says cling to life through misery. Okay, let's take a moment to address the elephant in the room. If antinatalists argue that it's better to have never been, then why don't they go skydiving without a parachute? And I don't mean to make light of this topic. It's a serious question that many great thinkers such as Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, Hume, and Camus have all given considerable thought. If it's better to have never been, then why continue to live? And after spending time with antinatalists, here's what I have learned. First, Antinatalism is narrowly focused on procreation, that creating a new life is a harm. However, the philosophy doesn't tell you what to do with a life that's already here, but it does raise the question because the core value that underpins antinatalism is the avoidance of suffering. And this is why nearly every antinatalist that I've met just so happens to be vegan. While I was in Fort Worth, there was somewhat of a crossover in activism. See how miserable they are and they're tired. He's like hitting them to so they like lift their head up to look at the camera and stuff. There was this longhorn across the street that was used as a ride and it really distracted and frustrated deets and noodles. And there were these horses that had spikes in their hooves to make them prance around. They just banned it in Tennessee. It's all pain induced. So with that being said, if you believe life is suffering, why continue to live? In the movie Shawshank Redemption, Brooks was incarcerated for 50 years, during which time he became so accustomed to prison life that it became preferable to him. Upon being paroled, Brooks releases his pet bird, Jake. The outside world is overwhelming. He struggles to adjust and finds himself failing at his job and feeling isolated. Make sure you double bag like the lady says, understand? Yes, sir. Surely will. He misses Jake, his beloved pet, and goes to the park hoping the bird will return. Brooks contemplates robbing the store where he works just to be sent back to prison. Ultimately, he chooses a different path, ending his letter with somber words. I doubt they'll kick up any fuss. Not for an old crook like me. Brooks isn't an antinatalist, but objectively, prison life is miserable when compared to freedom. But prisoners trudge on living due to the combination of fear, familiarity, and the small comforts or meanings that can be found within their current circumstances. Antinatalists never ask to be created. And if they could have not existed in the first place, they would have preferred that. Most of them discovered the philosophy in adulthood. They had a direction in life. They have family, they've made friends, and they have goals. 
And while, like Brooks, there certainly is a point in which they would bow out, their biology and culture has conditioned them to march forward in life. We'd never say a 50-year prison sentence following a double homicide is a life worth creating, but when you're in the midst of it, the next day presents itself. But that doesn't mean they wouldn't press the red button. If you could end suffering tomorrow, yeah, probably anything is justifiable probably by any means necessary. Like if I found out tomorrow that sentient extinction could possibly happen was skinning all the living things alive slowly, I'd hate it. I would say that it's what we have to do. This is Amanda, host of the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, and she's been featured on channels such as the Soft White Underbelly. And she does not shy away from the infamous red button thought experiment. And it goes like this. Let's say you have a big red button, and if you were to press it, all life would instantly vanish. No more humanity. Many antinatalists think you have a moral obligation to press the button. While it does involve ending people's lives, thus killing them, it would prevent all procreation. And in Amanda's point of view, it would end so much future harm that even if everyone had to be skinned alive, it would be well worth it. The, the only thing that really matters is the suffering coming to a finality. But not all antinatalists agree. It simply isn't anything to do with antinatalism. And I think there are two main reasons why it doesn't have anything to do with antinatalism. This is Lawrence Anton. And when I started this research journey, he was the first antinatalist I spoke with. Whatever formulation of the red button that is used, the ultimate question that is being asked is, if you could end all lives in an instant, would you? But one of the fundamentals of antinatalism is understanding that it pertains to starting lives, not continuing them or not ending them. Now, of course, someone could say, but the red button puts an end to all procreation. And isn't that what antinatalists want? Yes, antinatalists want an end to reproduction, but not by any means. This is like saying committing a genocide will lower the carbon footprint of humanity and environmentalists want humanity to have a lower carbon footprint. Yes, environmentalists want humanity to have a lower carbon footprint. But again, not by any means. It is not at all useful. It gives you no further information about the ethics of the act that you were originally talking about. It simply tells you about the length that that individual person is willing to go to have their ethical ideals realized. And after speaking with Lawrence and Amanda, I learned that there are many different opinions about antinatalism. And it's beyond the scope of this video to cover them all in detail. Antinatalism goes against the grain of people's most sacred notions of what life is and what they're supposed to be doing here. And in order for antinatalism to thrive, it probably does require tremendous societal shifts. I mean, we live in a pro-life, pro-natalist world. <laughs> I mean, and we're the antinatalists are the ones writing this bad product review. But I do actually sort of on one level agree with with Brian Kaplan that some of the arguments for antinatalism, I mean, they convince me I accept asymmetry and con the consent argument and everything, but I'm a hardcore antinatalist. They don't necessarily work on a, a regular population. And so there's there's tools in the antinatalist toolbox that we don't have. For a young couple planning on having children, accepting antinatalism requires so much sacrifice that it's a complete non-starter. The vast majority of childless young adults don't think that procreation is a moral harm. They just don't want kids or the responsibility and resources they require. The girl with a list on TikTok comes to mind. She famously cataloged hundreds of reasons to not have a child. A woman is more likely to postpone pregnancy after hearing about the 10 centimeter dilation is mostly for the head. It stretches out more for the shoulders. And unsurprisingly, virtually every con of having a child that was on this list was focused on the perspective of the mother, the swollen ankles, the lack of freedom, the expenses of having a child, and also many of the less talked about side effects of pregnancy. This is part two of why your booty goes flat after you've given birth. So if you haven't watched part Most people don't think about the child at all. They're just weighing the pros and cons of how their life would be if they had a child. And just like there are different types of childless couples, antinatalists come in many different flavors. Some are calm and collected, like Lawrence, and some antinatalists are outcasts, depressed, and are just unlikable in just about every way. You fuck are trying to shove down other people's throats. Fuck you. We're just goddamn 
lizards walking on two legs with a big giant f***ing ego. Because I'm anti-life, and it's just the fact, and I'm not afraid to say it. I'm anti-life. Life is stupid, okay? It's a parasitic, malicious little organism that attempts the DNA molecule, attempts to take over all the matter, consume all the matter, so it all becomes me. I mean, it's a psychotically stupid thing. And this antinatalist likes to confront people about procreation in public. All I'm doing here is requesting that we don't bring any more humans into existence. It's just a, it's just a request. I can't force you. Yeah, I can't force you, but I can tell you that about three weeks ago, three weeks ago, I took some amazing magic mushrooms. Uh. And his name is Danny Shine, and he is seemingly immune from social feedback. The man has absolutely no shame. And I was curious, what is it like being an antinatalist and a father? I don't think my children really understand my position on this. Because I, my theory is, and they, they object to this when I say this, we don't have long conversations about it because they're kind of fed up of it all, right? But I will know when they understand what I'm saying when they come up to me and they put their arms around me and they say, Dad, I can't believe that, how lucky I am that you, that you know that you're my dad and you've shared with me this and you saved me from making such a mess of my life, of the child's life, of my partner's life, um, you know, and you've saved me, you know, from, from doing this and from putting a human being in harm's way and co costing me a huge amount of money and God knows what else, right? Until they do that, I, that to me is a sign that they don't really understand what I'm saying. Gentlemen, please stop protesting illegally and go to your parents' house and protest there because they are the cause of all your problems. And the same applies to even some of the, you know, some of the people who call themselves antinatalists or uh, somewhere in the middle. I don't think they really understand that the, it's so huge and it's so simple as well. It's so simple, but, you know, like so many things in life, it's very, very difficult to, to get it on board. And, you know, when you say a parent, Yes, in some ways a parent, is, it's easier because they've already done it. And obviously people always claim, oh, yeah, there you are. You've had three kids. It's all right for you. Yeah, <laughs> right. But on the other hand, for a parent, it's, you could argue that it's much, much harder because you're admitting that you really didn't think about it properly and that what you did was, was really not a good idea and that we, both of us, had these three children when we hadn't even lived up a third of our lives now that I'm older I'm starting to see what old age is like. When I've given that to them, they might get dementia. I mean, I saw my mum die of terrible cancer. Why would? Why didn't I not think about, oh, okay, after I had my, my third child was after she died. Why didn't I put two and two together and say, yeah, my son might end up going through that. I don't want that to happen. But it just didn't enter my head. Let's keep creating kids for the sake of the in economy yes, yeah. are you joking exactly. mommy daddy why did you have me i'm finding this whole life a little bit challenging ah uh, you know i was in it for the sake of the economy my son now get to fucking work you so, slave so you want there to be less people on earth <laughs> although it's a difficult sort of idea to hold in some ways i'm very grateful that it was pointed out to me by a, a friend of mine i'm very very acutely aware of how limited my ability to seek out truth right the only thing i think that we can do is we can find out what isn't true we can research and notice things that isn't aren't true and i'm very biased i'm subject to all sorts of biases but i feel like you know i'm i'm no longer kind of fighting anymore i'm no longer you know I no longer need to be need, need to fight the system to, to keep this whole thing going i just see through it all and it's just you know it's crazy um the whole thing is crazy you could end up making the same mistake your parents made and it's not worth it. it just seems obvious to me that there's no good reason there's no need to bring in more beings that can and will suffer and die what for the ultimate biohack is to overcome that stupid weapon of mass destruction between your legs and realize that it's going to get you into serious trouble, sure that you never, ever create any children.
While antinatalists view procreation as a moral harm, the pronatalists I spoke with don't spend much time convincing others to have children. In fact, they probably wouldn't even identify as a pro-natalist if other people's choices didn't affect them. But in case you haven't heard, we are facing what many sociologists and demographers describe as population collapse. This is a population pyramid. It shows how many people exist within different age ranges. This pyramid shows a country with lots of children when compared to those in late adulthood. But this graph doesn't look anything like most of the world because this is a population pyramid for Uganda, where the average woman is having four and a half children compared to 1.8 in the United States. This is the population pyramid for the United States, but to me, it looks more like a population parfait. This large chunk right here, these are the baby boomers, the largest generation of humans the world has ever seen. Their children are down here. These are mostly millennials, like me, and some Gen Xers. And you might think that baby boomers aren't that large of a generation, but you must realize that as their average age increases, some of them won't be with us anymore. And if the pyramid starts to invert, which is what is happening, the population shrinks. And if it weren't for a steady rise in immigration, our pyramid in the USA would look a lot like Japan's, where adult diapers now outsell baby diapers. You can see that this trend of having less children started here. The boomers were born into large families, but didn't continue the trend. And here's the thing, the overall population will continue to grow for some time. But this isn't because people are having more kids, it's because overall mortality is decreasing. People are just living longer than they used to. So while the silent and greatest generation are dropping like flies, this giant boomer generation will hang around a bit longer than their predecessors. So we'll set some record-breaking global population numbers for a little while longer, but the ship has already sailed. The population will eventually collapse. And when it does, it will shrink as rapidly as it grew. People aren't having fewer babies because of war, poverty, or plague. Bring it out today! They're just choosing not to. And in South Korea, for every 100 people, there will be 4.3 great-grandchildren. That's a 96% extinction rate within the next century. And despite China's abolishment of its restrictive child policies, the fertility rate continues to decline. Today, most people alive are living during a time with the most humans the world will ever have. The only countries with high fertility rates are almost exclusively in regions like Africa. And while immigration from these regions could be a band-aid for the industrialized world for a little longer, it's just a matter of time before they start to industrialize as well. Because when a country industrializes and starts to educate their female population, the fertility rate crashes and does not recover. In a hundred years, I won't be here, right? And if I'm an antinatalist, I don't have any children to survive the disaster I'm leaving before them. Why is this my cross to bear? You really shouldn't care if you're an antinatalist and you are free and very welcome to let the line end with you. This movement is not about increasing human population indefinitely. It's not even about keeping it increasing. We're trying to warn people about the ramifications of a decreasing population because right now our economy, government stability, city infrastructure are all predicated on growing populations. And when a lot of people hear about the pronatalist movement, the first thing they assume is that we are trying to stop demographic collapse. Uh, we are trying to stop this precipitous fall in fertility rates. Uh, that is absolutely not the case. There is no way anyone can do that at this point. If we are on the Titanic, we are hitting the iceberg no matter what now. We are just trying to get as many lifeboats ready as possible and uh, as many people and as a diverse group of people on those lifeboats as possible. You, if you're watching this in an antinatalist, do not need to be a part of this. We don't want this movement to be about coercing anyone to have children, shaming anyone about not having children. This is about freedom. And the biggest reason why we're in this, again, is we want to protect people's freedom to choose, freedom over reproductive rights, and freedom to live in the culture that they value. I consider myself a logical person, but don't we all? And on one hand, I love my children and I want them to live their best lives. And if that includes starting a family, I wouldn't want to talk them out of it. But on the other hand, I don't want to be wrong. So I reached out to the most popular antinatalist, David Benatar, author of Better Never To Have Been, and I wanted to hear his response to the arguments I received from pronatalists. Why do people 
have such a hard time accepting antinatalist conclusions or antinatalism as a whole? Why is there such a barrier, do you think? Biology. I think the eons of evolutionary history of which we are the product, and that is going to militate in most cases, not, of course, with all people. We're going to have exceptions. But in general, in the human species, that's going to militate against acceptance of antinatalist ideas. How bad is procreation when you compare it to you know, heinous moral crimes like murder or, or, or something that's you know, almost not even <laughs> an unethical thing like a white lie or something? The problem with that question, I think, is that it could be understood in different ways. If we are thinking about a murder, for example, it's not simply the wrongfulness of the killing that people think about. They also think about the blameworthiness of the murderer, because all of us should know that murdering people is wrong. Now, when it comes to something like procreation, where the antinatalist idea is really a very minority idea, most people are never even exposed to that idea, we probably are not going to attach high levels of blame to people who, who procreate. And so uh, if I make a claim about the wrongfulness of the action, somebody might construe that as a claim about the blameworthiness of the action. Uh, how wrong it is for me would depend on how bad the child's life is. And sometimes you can tell in advance that the child's going to have a very bad life. Sometimes you might have good reason for thinking that it would have a less bad life than the norm. But it's in the nature of these things that one can never be sure about what's going to happen. In fact, there are very high levels of uncertainty about what would happen to any child that one produced. And so you really are playing a kind of roulette when you, uh, when you procreate. But the, the objective wrongness of it, I think, would depend on how severe that harm is. That would be different from the blameworthiness. A lot of people might have trouble with the idea that the parent of the genetic anomaly kid, you know, is he morally worse than the parent who procreated and kind of got lucky? I think a lot of people in the audience, you know, will, mm. will, will struggle to make that connection. Oh, yes. Well, this is the phenomenon of what's known as moral luck. And it doesn't appear only in this context. So let's imagine that you're driving and you take your eyes off the road for a moment and you hit a child and the child dies, well, you've done a terrible thing, you've killed the child. Whereas somebody else might take, take their eyes off the road for a moment, and they're lucky, nobody steps into the road, and they don't hit anybody. So they've both done exactly the same thing. One had a terrible consequence, uh, another didn't. And in fact, this phenomenon of moral luck really pervades our life. Another instance of it would be procreation. I presented the arguments against antinatalism from my interview with Brian Kaplan in the Collinses. Asymmetry is nonsense. Failure to get a good thing is actually, in principle, just as bad as the experiencing of a bad thing. And the prudent thing is to net, to sum. Full stop, iron line in the sand, no reasonable person would ever think otherwise, and only a weird dogma would get you off on some other track. The absence of benefit is not bad, if there is nobody to be deprived of the benefit. And I'm quite explicit that if there is somebody who is deprived of the benefit, then it is bad. So if you fail to win the lottery or you fail to get some pleasure that you could have got, that is bad because you're there and you're deprived of the benefit that you would otherwise have had. But if the reason why there's no pleasure is because there's no being to have the pleasure, that's what I'm saying is not bad. And I think a lot of people misinterpret your argument. They make the leap that um, life is good. And therefore, if you miss out on life, you're missing out on something good. You know, the trouble with this in my mind is you're, you're talking about someone who doesn't exist. So you're having to make this case that something that doesn't exist is missing out, which is, is the conundrum. There's a separate argument about how good or bad life is. And I think what you were doing in your representation was starting off with the assumption that uh, life is good and then saying that people are going to be deprived of that good. But there are two questions, really. The one is how good or bad is life? And the other question is the question about the axiological asymmetry. I informed Benatar about the conversation I was going to have with my children. I told him how I was going to introduce the concept that even the greatest pleasures or goods in life do not outweigh the worst sufferings or harms. The lion's pleasure 
and feasting on the zebra pales into comparison to the zebra's intense suffering as it's being eaten alive. So let me just clarify. So I, I'm not making the claim that some good could never outweigh pain because we do make these judgments in our life. We do. For example, we take the, the shot in order to prevent something much worse from happening later. And I'm not denying the rationality of that. Uh, all I'm saying is that if we look at the nature of things like pleasure and pain or the satisfaction of desires and the dissatisfaction of desires, there is an empirical asymmetry between them. It's not that we can never do comparisons and never do trade-offs that involve some pain. It's just that on balance, we've got very good reason for thinking that there's going to be more negative than positive. And I also asked Benatar what he thought of implied or hypothetical consent when making decisions about procreation. If you've got somebody, let's say, who's unconscious on the street, uh, you can't access their wishes because they're unconscious. And in fact, you don't even need to work on the basis of hypothetical consent, that they would have consented if they could have. It might be sufficient that it's, in, it's likely in their best interests for you to administer treatment. So, so think about not cases of adults who are lying on the street, but newborn babies who require medical treatment. They, consent makes no, no sense in a context like this because this child couldn't give consent even if it were fully conscious, it, it couldn't give consent to the child. There's no preferences of this being to access, but the standard that we normally use in scenarios like this is what's called the best interest standard. So you do what is going to be in the best interests of somebody. And if this is an already existing being, it's likely in their interest to continue existing unless that's outweighed, let's say, by the suffering that they're going to endure. And that's what would justify the treatment. But if you're speaking about a being that has not been brought into existence, it suffers no harm if it's not brought into existence. And so the idea that you're now going to benefit this being uh, by creating the being is completely disanalogous from the other kinds of case. Many people, many of the viewers are going to be asking themselves, well, I've experienced so many things in my life. You know, I've had good things, I've had bad things, and maybe tomorrow I'll get a terminal diagnosis or I'll get hit by a bus or something more horrific, like a some kind of liver problem that takes years and it's, you know, terrible death. And they would say, I'm okay with that. Why is that not justification to create a new life? Well, think about somebody who genetically engineered a contented slave. So they decided that they would produce a child, but they do some genetic engineering on the child that they, uh, that they implant, on the embryo that they implant, such that this person who's produced will be a servile, but a contentedly servile person. So they've been engineered to be this way. Would it be morally acceptable to produce a class of contented slaves? I think very few of us would say that it is. And that is because the life of a slave is not a good life. And the fact that it is sort of genetically adapted to being happy in that condition would not provide us with a license to produce that slave. And I think that what's going on in procreation is we don't have human genetic alteration of the beings that come into existence. But what we have is an evolutionarily constructed genome, as it were, that is going to incline people towards accepting their condition, their human condition. And I don't think the fact that people endorse this makes it justifiable. Mm. So the suggestion was that although you're bringing this child into existence without the child's consent, if the child turns out not to be happy with his or her life, they've always got the choice of taking their own lives, of, uh, of engaging in suicide. And they, they found the idea that you'd want to avoid somebody having to make that decision as uh, morally monstrous. And I think the opposite is morally monstrous. I think it underestimates a few things. First of all, it underestimates lots of people's access to painless suicide, painless and effective suicide. So it may be that in some parts of the world now, some states in the US and in Canada and a few other places, Switzerland, that you can get access to medically assisted dying and it can be a relatively painless and, uh, and effective procedure. 
but there are many other people who are going to have to choose some alternative self-administered way of suicide. And it might be either ineffective or it might be painful. Uh, and so it's not a real option that everybody has. And secondly, even if you do have the option of medically assisted suicide, given the life drive that people have, you have to reach immense levels of pain, psychic pain, before you're going to take your life. And even then, you going to be racked with concerns about what you would do to people who leave behind. This is, this is a, an immensely weighty decision. And to put somebody into a position like that is vastly different from not creating them in the first place. But you've now asked me about this person who's unconscious and needs help. And I don't think that that is an analogy for the procreation case. Because when you have an unconscious person, they already exist. And they have an interest in continuing to exist. And so when you administer that help to them, you're doing what is likely in their best interests. Whereas when you're contemplating procreation, there's not a being that exists there. And if I'm correct about the asymmetry argument, the axiological asymmetry argument, it's not in their interest to come into existence. And that's the fundamental disanalogy between the rescue case and the case of procreation. So... Who are the people who have properly addressed Benatar's version of antinatalism? I did some research and discovered Christine Overall, who wrote the book, Why Have Children? She dedicated an entire chapter to Benatar's arguments. And would she make me feel better about my decision to have three children? Can I encourage my daughters in good faith to start families of their own? Overall offers up a thought experiment where half the people on a planet 5 million to be exact, are happy, and 5 million are suffering. In this scenario, an angel petitions God to fix the situation. In her first scenario, God recreates everyone to not suffer, and the angel is pleased. But then she posits, God could have alternatively rolled back time and not created anyone. This is obviously what she sees antinatalism as, rolling back time and not creating anyone. She states that the angel would be displeased with this option. But I would say that the thought experiment falls flat because undoing or rolling back the creation of a life is not fundamentally different from murder. Like if someone said they could roll back time and have me not created, I think I'd feel about the same as if they were trying to end my life because to me, it's the same outcome. And she does bring this contention up in the book, but I think the thought experiment only seems morally repulsive because the angel witnesses the non-creation of the previously created 10 million people. Overall, waffles her way out of the problem on page 100. She creates a situation where there is no God. An unexplained mystery of the cosmos warps back in time and does not create the 10 million people. The problem is the reader interprets rolling back time and not creating the 10 million people as essentially killing them. They existed in one scenario and now they don't. Whether it's God or an unexplained mystery, people being uncreated is not the same as never existing. And despite my bias to want overall to find a contradiction in Benatar's logic, I didn't find a good argument in her book. I'll spare you from going through all of her objections, but in my humble opinion, she just doesn't understand Benatar. The worst defense is when she cites an argument that one of her students created. Imagine a bag of jelly beans with two flavors, one you hate and one you love. You don't know the proportions of the bag and you are given a choice. Reach in and you must eat them or don't. I think you can see where this is going. Life has suffering, the black licorice, and life has pleasure, the normal jelly beans. I intuitively just don't even agree with this thought experiment. Nobody would take the challenge. I hate black licorice, and if I had to eat even one in a handful, it wouldn't be worth it. But I wanted to see what my family thought. Wait, so do we have to eat the whole thing or whatever we get? Uh, yes. Yeah. So here's the deal. Ugh. You're forced to start the game, but you but you can opt out if you don't if you want to. Okay. No, I'm not opting out. I'm doing this. All right, Lily, you want to go first? Oh, <laughs> oh no. I have to eat all of it. I feel like you got like a mix maybe or yeah, what? Mix. So start eating. Wish me luck. <laughs> Are you just going to get that over with? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Both of your plates could be entirely licorice. Oh. So Lily, so you're not having a very good time over there. 
Not in gray, what are you talking about? She's powering third. Now, let me ask you this. Cool. If you could start over and not play this game, would you would you choose that? Yeah. Okay. So you would choose not to? Mm. Okay. Mm. You're not glad to have played the game? Yeah, no. <laughs> no? Okay. <gasps> so would you recommend this game to someone else? Mm. No. I see what's happening here. All right, mommy. <laughs> what do you have? Go ahead and lift up. Just, just mommy. Mm. Right, but What'd why? Oh, let's go. Let's go. Let's <laughs> like go, let's mostly go. licorice. Oh no. And you said I don't have to play this game. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to just opt out? <laughs> yeah, I don't want to do this. <laughs> okay, mommy's opting out. Well, can I have these though? <laughs> uh, <laughs> not for the video, but. Ew! <laughs> So, okay. it, Lily, you're technically opting out. Is that okay? I mean, it's fine. There's, you don't lose any points. You just opt yeah. out. Okay. I'm doing this. Okay, I'm doing Aubrey, it. Like, no matter let's what? Let's see yours. Mm -hmm. <gasps> <laughs> what do you have? What do you have? Show me. Show, no, show me. Oh, yeah. It's like mostly... How many actual licorice do you have? A one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so it's mostly one, two, jelly beans. Three, four, but you, again, if you're going to eat the jelly beans, you got to eat the licorice, okay? Okay, do you think this is a worthwhile deal? So far, yeah, it's great. If... You had to play this game again, and I were to mix these cups up, and you, and you could get... <laughs> if you had to play this game again, and you could get a plate full of the black licorice like mommy, would you play this game again if you had to eat everything? Mm-mm. No. Interesting. Would you recommend someone else play this game? If it, my, if it was my enemy, then yeah. I'd be like, this is so fun. But not someone that I like. Yeah. Okay. Apparently my entire family would have been better off had the experiment never been, but then I found David Boonin, a philosopher who has written extensively on a range of controversial moral issues. He wrote a paper in response to Benatar titled, Better to Be. He writes in the first page, Benatar's fundamental claim is difficult to believe. It arises from an admirably simple and ingenious argument whose premises are not only plausible, but difficult to deny. Intriguing. This was my first thought as well. Boonin uses an example of a blessed couple and a cursed couple. The blessed couple can produce a child with a wonderful life full of only pleasure, and the cursed couple would produce a child with a life completely filled with pain and suffering, absent of pleasure. Our intuition is that it would be wrong to create the cursed child, but people do not object to the blessed couple choosing to just not procreate. If you agree with these moral intuitions, Benatar's asymmetry explains why this is the case. But what do we do about a lucky child? Boonin defines a lucky child as a life filled with mostly pleasure and happiness, but does contain a small amount of pain and suffering. According to Benatar, the lucky child is better to have never been, because a non-existent child cannot be deprived of pleasure. Again, our moral intuition is that it's not wrong for the blessed couple to not have the blessed child. So there's nothing wrong in a lucky child missing out on the pleasures that they might experience. But in the case of the lucky child, any pain and suffering the child experiences will harm the child. And this could have been avoided uh, by never conceiving. Boonin summarizes Benatar's conclusion. And since your life and my life contains at least some pain as well, you and I were harmed by being conceived too. We would all have been better off never having been. Finally, someone who actually understands Benatar. But how does he get around Benatar's asymmetry? He writes, One way to object to Benatar's argument then would be to identify an alternative principle that does an even better job of explaining the asymmetry and that produces a different result in the case of the lucky couple. And so he modifies Benatar's argument. If the absence of pain can be better than the presence of pain, even when there is no actual person who enjoys the absence of pain, that is, then the absence of pleasure can be worse than the presence of pleasure, even when there is no actual person who is deprived of the absent pleasure. He creates what he calls the relational symmetry principle. Boonin argues that since a person would not exist without procreation, they cannot be harmed by being brought into existence. Harm requires a comparative state where the person is worse off, but this doesn't apply when the alternative is 
non-existence. Moreover, Bunin criticizes Benatar's asymmetry between pain and pleasure, advocating instead for a relational symmetry that treats the absence of pleasure as similarly bad as the presence of pain, depending on the context of the actual person's interests. The problem with this modification is that the blessed couple, who remains childless, is depriving their future child of pleasure by remaining childless. Because if the absence of pleasure is bad, in the same way that the presence of pain is bad, not having the blessed child is also bad, right? Budin writes, if the blessed couple decides to conceive the blessed child, for example, then things will be better from the point of view of the interests of the blessed child, and the blessed child will therefore not be made worse off by the decision. If the blessed couple decides not to conceive the blessed child, then things will be worse from the point of view of the interests of the blessed child. But the blessed child will not exist, and so will not be an actual person who has been made worse off by the decision. Regardless of which choice the blessed couple makes, then no actual person will be made worse off by their decision. But what about the lucky child? The child with mostly pleasure and a small amount of suffering. Bunin's version of Benatar's asymmetry states, since the total amount of pleasure outweighs the total amount of pain, in this case, the magnitude of the advantage that existence has over non-existence is greater than the magnitude of the advantage of non-existence has over existence. And so, Budin has provided an alternative argument as to how the blessed couple isn't committing harm by not having a child, while at the same time the lucky couple isn't committing a moral harm by having a child who will still experience pain and suffering. There are several problems with Boonin's arguments though, such as nobody knows what's going to happen before conceiving a child. You don't know if you are the unlucky couple where your child's life is not mostly pleasure. And according to Benatar, we underestimate the amount of pain in our lives and we overestimate the pleasure we received. But if perception is reality, does it really matter? In It's a Wonderful Life, George Bailey actually said two things. I suppose it would have been better if I'd never been born at all. I suppose it would have been better if I'd never been born at all. And I wish I had never been born. I said I wish I'd never been born. The movie may have proved the world was better off with George in it. He saved his brother's life. He stopped the local pharmacist from accidentally poisoning a child. And when his father died of a sudden stroke, George sacrificed his lifelong dreams to run his family business. By doing so, he helped keep the business open to provide affordable loans to working class people. And during the Great Depression, when a bank run threatens the building and loan, George uses the money he had saved for his honeymoon with Mary to keep the business afloat. And so you could say the world was better off with George in it. But what about George? If George never existed, he wouldn't have needed to sacrifice his dream to save his family business. He didn't have a dream to sacrifice. He didn't have to jump into the icy water going deaf in one ear to save his brother. He didn't have a brother. And he didn't need to remedy a bank run during the Great Depression. The Great Depression wouldn't exist for him. The film doesn't examine the counterfactual. A world where a Hollywood scriptwriter doesn't pencil in a happy ending with a guardian angel. But I'm sure at this point, you are all curious as to what my conclusion is after this journey. Am I an antinatalist? I will tell you this. I don't plan on having any more children. However, I wasn't planning on having any more children when I started this project over a half a year ago. My conclusion around antinatalism is complicated. I believe that many families mindlessly bring children into the world for wrong reasons. But on the other hand, I would encourage my daughters to start families of their own. And as for the intro quote, I do believe there are almost an infinite number of ways to mess things up. I worry about what can go wrong and does go wrong for families all over the world. But I think the best way to summarize my overall feeling is this letter I found from Mike Rowe of Dirty Jobs. He was writing in response to someone asking why he decided to not become a parent. And here's what he said. The question is certainly personal and hard to answer without casting a subtle judgment on a certain lifestyle and probably offending a few people. But what the heck, it's a foggy morning in San Francisco and I'm feeling verbose and I'm quite sure that a staggering number of moms and dads have no business being parents. 
As institutions, I have no problem with marriage or parenthood, and I enjoy kids when they're enjoyable, but the relative ease into which parenthood can be accomplished is breathtaking, especially when you consider the conspicuous lack of qualifications required. Every other undertaking in life demands some level of proven competence or maturity, from driving a car, to owning a gun, to casting a vote, to having a drink, to building a garage on your own property. Such things require licenses, permits, and permissions, but not raising kids. No. The most difficult task a human being can embark upon, the lifelong commitment of parenthood, requires no qualification whatsoever. And yet, the default question regarding having kids is always, why not? And not as the original poster suggests, the far more logical, why? Personally, I've never heard a really compelling, thoughtful argument for or against parenthood. All positions, when closely examined, reveal the clever workings of our true nature. Our minds are wired to justify and defend those decisions already made, or more often, our own pre-existing condition. This is normal, I think. People with families want to feel good about their decision to have kids, and people without kids don't want to feel as though they missed out. No one likes regret. So to preserve the illusion of our own wisdom and sanity, we build apologetics around our current situation and define the road not taken in a way that justifies our current state. Thus, I find myself looking at my married friends, haggard and worn, surrounded by their screaming toddlers and their petulant teenagers, ungrateful and sullen, and I feel a great sense of personal relief. Likewise, my married friends probably see me as a sad and misguided vagabond who has confused freedom with happiness and destined to wind up alone in a cold, indifferent world. Whatever. Envy and pity are often two sides of the same coin, depending on the kind of day you're having, and we all spend too much time looking for validation and assurances that we haven't botched up our one chance at happiness. In the end, we all just want to feel content with the life we have so we gravitate towards those who share our choices and look with curiosity upon those who do not. We validate, we affirm, we reassure, and we add another page to a made-up story that helps us live with the consequences of our decisions and answer questions like, Mike, why no kids? Here's my answer. My reasoning for not having kids is due to the fact that I am selfish, and if I ever change my mind and decide to have a family, my reasoning will be the same. Either way, it's a dirty job. Hey everyone, I want to make more videos, but I struggle with the monetization side of things. I don't want to have brand advertising, and YouTube has a tendency to demonetize the type of content I make. So if you'd like to join me and help me grow this channel, I'd love for you to join my Patreon community. I have a bunch of ideas, which I will post on the Patreon page. You don't have to be a member to see this, so I invite you to check it out. I want to do one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions, live Q&As, gaming nights. I have 100 ideas floating around right now. Anyways, I'll see you guys in the next video.